Hello, I'm Ed Fuquay, Young Adult Librarian Extraordinaire here at Woonsocket Harris Public Library. Solitaire Frisbee from the Children's Room. And we're here for another conversation. We're traveling the world of mythology. We're heading to the frozen north today. Oh, okay. Mythology of the Inuits. It's appropriate for today's climate. For today's weather, it's very appropriate. Um, I found the Inuit people and the religion fascinating. So this, this will hopefully be a good one. All right. Um, Again, as always, the very different view of the world. Um, the first thing I learned is that um, I used the word Eskimo for a long time. And Eskimo is not a bad word to use. But Eskimo includes all the people that live in that area, whereas Inuit refers to a specific subclass of people. Oh. So, um, and their Inuits are a wide and diverse group. They're scattered all across the world, from Russia to Greenland, of course, Alaska and Canada. Um, and because of that, they have an oral storytelling tradition. So there are several different versions of all these stories, which I think I've said for every different group. So if we back up for a minute, mm -hmm. um, we have Inuit and yep. Eskimo. Yes. Now Eskimo includes everybody who lives in that region. And Inuit is just one particular group of people. There's dozens of other tribes who aren't Inuits, who are Eskimos. So what makes an Inuit? Um, they're a specific language group. OK. Um, so genetically speaking, the same, but yeah. the difference is just the language. Yeah. Okay. So, um, now, most religions are about fostering a sense of community with the people and giving people a higher purpose to their lives. Um, however, Inuit religion kind of works differently. They live in an extremely harsh environment. And so a lot of their myths are devoted to generating enough paranoia to help them survive in a climate that is constantly trying to kill them. Um, it, they have taboos and rituals that will keep them alive. All the things that they have to do to, um, to keep from dying. And most of them are based on very like sensible things. They're very dependent on the food that they killed because there's very little to eat up there. Um, in the winter time, there's pretty much nothing but snow. And yeah. So while we're talking about the Inuits, the, the religion of the Inuits that you just referenced, these qualities would still be applicable to all Eskimos, yes? In many ways, but not necessarily. Some of the specific stories are, are just with the Inuits. Okay, and again, the Inuit is language, so it's not that the religion is what makes them Inuit. Right, it's, it's their language group and their ethnicity and so forth. Um, the, uh, I should give a trigger warning because, uh, because they live in a harsh environment, so many of these myths are very harsh. Um, for instance, one of the explanations they have for the Northern Lights is that those are the flashing lights of the spirits in the afterlife who are playing a sort of a kickball game that they have <laughs> up in the sky. And their version of the afterlife, instead of having a hell, their version of the afterlife is um, that you go to a place where it's always warm and there's always plenty to eat and there's nothing to do but like play games all day. Um, However, they also say that the spirits of the dead um, play their ball game, like soccer, uh, with the severed heads of naughty children who won't obey their parents. <laughs> I'm stuck on the, the food and the playing games, and it's warm. Their afterlife has all the things they generally don't get when they're alive, like lots of food and plenty of warmth and leisure time. D they genuinely see this as a bad thing? No, they see that as a good thing. The afterlife gives them everything they don't have in life. That their life is a constant struggle against the elements. Maybe I misunderstood, but you said this is their version of hell. It's their version of the afterlife. They don't really have a hell. Uh, oh, I thought you said hell. Okay. It's, they technically don't have one, but there's at least three different versions of the afterlife I found, and this is one of them. Gotcha. That makes um, sense now. There is, in theory, an afterlife of spirits who are in the sky, spirits who are in the water, and spirits who are underground. Okay. And each one is slightly different. Um, there's some ones in the sky that had the horrific st story about the severed head, so I, I led with them. <laughs> <laughs> so do they explain how the... Oh, because it's the children who didn't listen. Yeah, the children disobey their parents, and then the spirits will reach down from the sky and grab their heads and pop them right off and bring them up and play soccer with oh, them. Like dandelions. Yeah. Um, okay. So th many of their myths are full of really obvious like morals. Like they have one of the monsters up in the Arctic. They have lots of great monsters. Um, also, the Inuit language translated into English involves a lot of cues. 
Interesting. Yeah. And I've listened to some of them speaking Inuit on YouTube, and it doesn't sound like a cue necessarily to my ears, but, you know, what do I know? I'm a long way from being an expert on languages. <laughs> uh, they have the Kualapuliat. The Kualapuliat is basically a slimy green creature with, like, long black hair that lives in the water, and it floats in the water near the edge of the, the ice pack. So if a little child wanders too close to the water, it reaches up and grabs it and pulls them under and drowns them. Because the obvious moral of that is, like, don't let little kids go near the water. Um, the, uh, the word for spirit or soul in the Inuit is anarik. And anarik refers to the spirits of both people and animals, since they thought, like many tribes, that animals and people were more or less the same. So they have lots of stories involving shapeshifters. Um, basically, people who can change into animals or animals that change into human form. Um, their shapeshifters are generally um, uh, neutral. They're neither good nor evil. Like people, some can be good, some can be bad. Um, but if somebody shows up in a story who's kind of shady and mysterious or hides his eyes behind like snow goggles, he's probably guaranteed to be a shapeshifter. <laughs> um, so I said they live their life by a lot of rules, which you had to have to survive in this environment. Uh, they include rules like um, if you kill an animal, use all of it. Use every part of the animal. I mean, they couldn't cut down a tree to get wood to make things. They couldn't mine copper or anything. Basically, all you had was what you killed. Mm -hmm. And so you have to use every single part of the animal that you can. Otherwise, it's disrespectful. I agree. Yep. Also, if you kill a polar bear, this is important. If you kill a polar bear, remember, you have to cut off its head. And you put his head on a stick and have it facing the same direction it was going when you attacked it. That way its spirit can just keep right on going back to its den and he'll be fine after that. Um, also, uh, either close the eyes on the polar bear or at least don't cut up the animal in front of the head because it doesn't need to see that. You know? Yes, it, it's a dead polar bear, so isn't, you don't have to like cut it up right in front of it like that. It's also good to make the, the spirit of the polar bear happy to give it gifts after you've killed it. You can bring something and lay it um, where the, the severed head is that you know, I could want or use. And also if you smear blubber across the nose, it won't be able to smell your human scent anymore. That'll make it feel better. So I wonder, because I mean, honestly, that, that just sounds so kind mm -hmm. and, and like thoughtful. Does that kindness extend into their human relationships? Um, in some ways. In the case of animals, because they're totally dependent on the animals that they hunt, um, if you treat the polar bear with that much respect, then it, it has to acknowledge that respect. Um, and so a polar bear that you've treated so very well after killing it is the kind of polar bear who will let himself get killed again next winter. After he's reborn, he'll come back and you're going to have a chance to kill him again. He won't make it easy, of course. He's a polar bear. But still, as long as you treat them respectfully, they'll have the same respect for you. Okay. Um, now, as to, as to how they treat each other, you were asking? Mm -hmm. um, they seem to have a very like cool, laid-back culture because um, they lived on the edge of extinction all the time, so they couldn't afford to have a lot of petty feuds and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, they had some polygamy. They had um, things were kind of arranged so there wouldn't be too much inbreeding. If you had a small village that was cut off by like you know hundreds of miles of ice, you had to be careful. You didn't want you want to avoid having too many people who related to each other get together. So they had various ways to avoid that. Basically, they all got along. They saw themselves sort of an, as an extended family. It seems. Cool. Um, all of which, of course, is broken up when, of course, missionaries came. Um, that was my next because you're the way that you're grammatically speaking about them as though they no longer exist. Generally, that kind of attitude doesn't exist because honestly who wants to live on an ice floe with no food for like you know most of the year does um, that mean to say that Inuits are are they gone now or no they're still there I mean there's thousands of them okay. and there's plenty of Inuit storytellers still telling you know some of these stories um, traditionally in their society the men were hunters and uh, the women instead of being like farmers as happened in so many other societies the women did everything else that wasn't killing animals the women were the ones that built the shelters. The women were the ones that, that cured the meat, that tanned the hides. 
that you know sewed everything and made their clothing that kept them alive and because the men are often gone for weeks or occasionally months at a time the women basically ran the village themselves where the men weren't there so they were very independent um, and there also, there, was, there wasn't a severe breakdown of, of sex roles. The men are expected to hunt, the women are expected to stay home. If a woman wanted to hunt, though, there was, that was no big deal. And men are expected to know many of the so-called women's chores, too. Okay. Because if you're out there by yourself on the ice, you've got to know how to treat the meat and things like that yourself. You can't depend on dragging it back and having your woman do it for you. Um, and also because there, there were so few of them in these villages, if like a hunter died out in the ice, which happened quite frequently, uh, his widow would often like move in with another family. Yeah. And that's why they had polygamy. Okay. Um, also, if you kill a seal. Now, as you all know, a seal's soul is contained in its bladder. So you can eat all the seal except its bladder. You set that aside and you store it and you treat it with great reverence and respect. And then when the spring comes, you bring it out and you put it in the water and there's a big like bladder ceremony where it's returned to the water and that way the seal can be reborn. As long as you don't damage the bladder, the seal will come back to life again. All very important things. All right. Um, I said the Arctic was full of monsters. Uh, one of my favorite monsters is the Aklut. Um, the Akhlut, A-K-H-L-U-T, is how it's spelled in English. The Akhlut is part orca and part wolf. He's half killer whale and half arctic wolf. Um, you can imagine this, like, huge, like, killer whale with four legs that rises out of the ice and chases you across the ground with a pack. It is difficult to imagine. Yeah. I mean, the next time I'm DMing a game and my players go to the Arctic Circle, they will definitely fight these guys. <laughs> they are extremely <laughs> cool monsters. What are they um, called? Uh, one more time. They're called? Aklut. Aklut. Cool. The Aklut come from a guy who was obsessed with the sea. He spent all of his time, instead of doing his duty, staring out at the water. And eventually his village got kind of tired of him of not pulling his own weight. So they threw him out. So he was left to die in the Arctic wilderness. But he watched some wolves running along and saw them bring down like caribou and eat it and thought, well, that, that's the life for me. So he started running with the wolf pack and learned how to actually run and kill and eat raw meat like the wolves did, which in a sense made him mystically part wolf. But because his obsession was with the ocean, he eventually dove into the water. We did the same thing with killer whales and became part orca. He became literally, he stopped being human and became literally half wolf and half orca. And then he gave birth to a whole like line of monsters. In the original stories, um, he, he could, they, they could change back and forth from being a, fully, a full wolf or a full orca. But whenever um, artists and sculptors and things like that do a depiction of them, they're always in mid-transformation. Because the like, you know, killer whale with a wolf snout is just so cool. So prior to the ocean, when he was learning alongside the wolf pack, uh, I say alongside, was, mm -hmm. was he actually, did they accept him into the pack or was it like from a distance? Supposedly they accepted him. Supposedly he was it part is, of it the It is, pack. yes. Um, the moral of the story is that you have to pull your own weight in the village. He was thrown out to die in the Arctic wilderness and he managed to survive by becoming an animal or becoming a monster. That if you leave the village, you lose your humanity. So he became a monster that preys on other people. Um, and he's exactly the kind of monster who was killed frequently by the next character we're going to meet. Um, they have several like gods and they have several like great heroes. Um, the first one I want to introduce you to is um, Kiviuk. K-I-V-I-U-Q. You're getting a gold star today. <laughs> uh, Kiviuk um, is the eternal wanderer. He's sort of the Odysseus of the Arctic Circle. Okay. Um, he was a guy who, um, he was a hunter. He went out alone with his kayak um, out onto the Arctic water to bring back like food for his wife and his family and so forth. And um, uh, he kept going further and further to get like more and more food. And eventually he fell in with this beautiful witch who turned out to be a shapeshifter, surprise. He had to kill her. And so he went paddling back to his, his people with his canoe full of like meat and fought several more monsters along the way. And then when he finally got there, he noticed how different the village was from when he left. And he sees his son, who was a baby when he left, who's now a grown man, and says that his wife has been dead for years. Um, 
And in one version of the story, his son tells him, you can't stay with us anymore because you're dead. And he realizes he went out too far in the ice flow and now he can never go back again. Mm. So he became the eternal wanderer of the Arctic Circle. Um, he kills monsters and saves villages. He shows up in times of need. Um, he fought several shapeshifters. They have a whole bunch of monsters up there. They have giants. Uh, he fought cannibals. Cannibalism was a big problem up there because food was short. So there's many warnings, dire warnings about what happens if you eat human flesh. So he fought a tribe, a, a village that turned cannibal. He had, he had to kill those guys. He also fought a giant squid at one point. Um, but yeah, now some people say he's not really truly immortal, um, that his body is slowly turning to stone. Now the last time he was seen by a village, his body was about half stone. And so some of the storytellers say that his body ever turns fully stone, he becomes a statue, that'll be the end time, it'll be the end of the universe. Hmm. So as so long as he's up there paddling his kayak, going from one village to another in the Arctic Circle, we're all fine. Interesting. It's kind of a cool story. And as so often happens, there's a bunch of stories about monsters that he fought, but the, sto the quote, stories are usually only one or two sentences long. I said the same thing about some of the other things a couple of weeks ago. You know, first he fought this monster, then he fought that monster. If it was Greek mythology, they'd go on and on about fighting the monster. Mm -hmm. But in the Native American mythology, it just happens. Yeah, he defeated a giant squid. Then he, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the coolest um, Inuit goddess I want to talk about is Sedna. If you've heard of like nobody from the Arctic Circle, you've heard of Sedna. Although you probably have her, she's not that famous, but she was the first Inuit goddess that I encountered. I thought she was very cool. She has a tragic backstory, very brutal one. Um, I first encountered her actually in Marvel Comics. Uh, she fought Thor. She actually she captured Thor and wanted to mate with him because she was lonely living at the bottom of the sea. <laughs> and she had a giant monster swallow his hammer, leaving him powerless. But fortunately, Namor the Submariner came along and defeated the sea monsters while Thor was able to escape. He wanted to? Yeah. Well, in the Marvel Comics version, she's not that attractive. She looks kind of fishy. But in almost every version by native artists, I notice she's extremely hot. Hmm. Um, in fact, well, you'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, except for one minor, like, you know, deformity that she can never get rid of. Uh, there are several different versions of the story. I tried to find, like, the least horrific version of her story. Um, but they're all pretty bad. <laughs> There is no good version of the Sedna story. Oh, gosh. Um, so in virtually every version, Sedna is a beautiful young girl growing up in a village, and all the young men in the village are interested in her, but she's too good for them. She spurns their affections and has no interest in any of the boys from her village. Um, so not surprisingly, her vanity and her ego is punished, because that happens an awful lot. Women who step out of line or are too full of themselves get punished, sadly. Yeah. Um, there's even a version of the story in which she says that, to prove her point, she says that she would rather be with the village dogs than the men of the village. And so to prove her point, she does. And that gives birth to Europeans, the white people. <laughs> However, eventually a guy comes along who sweeps her off her feet. He's handsome. He describes his lavish, like, you know, house that he's built, his tent, where she has everything she ever wanted and warm furs to sleep on. Um, and so she falls for him and he paddles away in the boat and she, and she winds up finding herself suddenly on this, like, barren island, this barren windswept island. And there's nothing but the rocky crags and this crude structure made out of wood. And there's really coarse walrus hide to sleep on. And it turns out, wouldn't you know it, he's actually a bird. He's a shape-shifting bird creature who now has her captured on this island. And in fact, the worst thing is he's such a terrible hunter, all he can catch is fish. <laughs> so she has nothing to eat but fish, and she's stuck in this miserable island in the middle of nowhere, and now, of course, she's really sad that you know, this all happened to her. Um, the moral of that story, of course, being that girls should marry the suitor that her parents pick out for her. Um, but it gets worse. It goes on from there. Um, because, um, you know, she prays for his deliverance, and her father hears her prayers from far away and paddles to the island to see how she's doing. So he gets in his kayak and he goes to the island. He's, of course, appalled at the way his daughter is being treated. And so he pulls out his spear, has a fight with the bird creature, and kills him. Kills him dead. Um, and so then, as he's taking his daughter away, um, the other birds on the island, who are also shape-shifting monsters, see what's going on. They start attacking. 
and the beating of their wings causes like huge waves and the boy's in danger of capsizing. So the father thinks to himself, and in some version of the story, um, he decides that um, the birds are really only angry at his daughter for, for you know, her two-facedness. And so he shoves his daughter over the side. And some of them he shoves his daughter over the side to keep, just to keep the boat from capsizing. But either way, he does not win father of the year. Her vanity must have been severe because, I mean, he, he went to the trouble. Yeah, he went to the trouble of rescuing her. And then on the way back, when the storm hit, he's like, well, she's always been kind of a pain in the neck anyway, into the water with her. <laughs> Um, now, don't forget, in Arctic water, falling into the water was a death sentence. Because, because of hypothermia, you can't last more than like 10, maybe 20 minutes in, in freezing water at best. Mm -hmm. um, so he shoves his daughter into the water, and naturally she's extremely upset, and she tries to pull herself back onto the boat. So he pulls out his knife, and he chops off her fingers. Yeah, I told you, trigger warning. Um, in fact, he chops off her fingers, first with the joints at the very end of the fingers, and then she keeps trying to pull herself back into the boat. So he chops them off at like the knuckle. And then finally, all the way down to, to her, the base of her, her fingers. Um, however, as it turned out, as her severed fingers fall into the water, they change into animals. And they become seals and walruses and orcas. Um, in fact, they become all the sea mammals that the Inuits depend on for their survival. Hmm. Um, so she sinks to the bottom of the sea, um, and the water transforms her. Water is transformative. Although it kills you, it also can change you. So she sinks all the way to the bottom of the sea, where she finds herself becoming a goddess. She's now the goddess of the sea, she controls storms, and she also has control over all the animals of the sea. So she controls all the seals and walruses and killer whales and so forth. Um, what form does she take? Well, she remains human. Uh, however, um, she has no fingers. In most of the depictions, she looks like a beautiful woman um, with just a mutilated hand. In some versions of it, after she loses her fingers, she grows flippers in the place. Mm -hmm. But in some versions of it, she just doesn't have hands, doesn't have fingers. And artists and sculptors will frequently pose her so she's like hiding her, her digitless hands. Um, also, in several versions of it, she's not wearing any clothes because she can't do buttons or tie knots or anything. Now, she's a very, very important goddess um, because she controls the animals they, they live on. Without her commanding the animals to let themselves be hunted, they will all starve to death. Um, so they depend on her, her good nature. And she already isn't too fond of people because, let's face it, her father murdered her. Mm. So she starts out with a chip on her shoulder about human beings. So they have to be very careful to stay on her good side. So all these ritual and taboos that, 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 that they practice, she keeps an eye on them. And she will know if some village isn't treating the animals respectfully and will deny them any seals for the next like, couple of months or so. Um, and she could also bring storms that will make their lives really miserable. Um, so her, making her happy depends on survival. Um, and so the way you do that involves the village shaman. Um, so they had village shaman who were specially trained to um, dive into the water and swim down to where Sedna lives. And it is, of course, a huge epic journey. She's protected by flesh-eating seals that will rip you to shreds. And there is a giant sea scorpion named Kanajuk. Kanajuk, the sea scorpion, will attack you. And there's also, like, you know, rolling boulders that will roll across you at the bottom of the sea. Um, shaman can't do this physically, of course, because the water will kill you. But they can send out their spirit, will go forth down to where she lives. And the rolling boulders can even crush spirits, by the way. So she's very well protected. Um, but when you get down there, um, you, you discover that one of her issues is, because she has no fingers, she has no way of combing her hair or taking care of herself. So her hair is always in wild disarray in every version of it you see in paintings and sculptures and, and carvings and so forth. And so what the shaman has been trained to do is to comb and braid her hair. That's the way to make Sedna happy and calm her down again so she'll send the seals for you to eat. So, this, so he has to send down his spirit with a spirit comb um, to comb out the knots in her hair very carefully because yeah, yeah. Comb with knots very carefully. Do not tug on the hair and hurt her. And then he also can braid her hair too to make her look really nice. 
and then she'll be fine for a while and she'll send the animals back to be eaten okay yeah and to this day they have uh, people who have a a big like uh, ceremony in which the shaman will go into a trance to to go down and you know take care of Sedna um, now I've talked about shaman several times I've never actually defined the term I realized um, shaman are what I used to call like the medicine man when I was a kid mm -hmm. um, and part of what they do is heal the village they know the herbs that are good for you and things like that um, but their real role isn't so much physical it's spiritual mm -hmm. um, a shaman and the idea of a shaman stretches all the way across the world um, and the concept of a shaman is, is very prevalent in, even in today's society I know people who call themselves urban shaman that they take the, that that community with the spirit world into our modern society in every way that they can um, and generally speaking to become a shaman you have to gain the power to talk to spirits and you are the living conduit who communicates between the world of the living and the world of spirits frequently the spirits are the world of the dead mm -hmm. and so to become a shaman you have to survive some horrific experience there's almost always something awful um, some near-death experience and then, and then the shaman awakens from it and he suddenly has all these powers um, that, that's actually a common theme in like urban fantasy and things like that um, you'll run into characters who have died or survived something and they come back with an extra gift or ability or something like that um, now in the case of the Inuit they have special circumstances um, their shaman were very very important because like many like many natives they believed that everything had a spirit and so communicating with the spirits was like one of the most important things in their society. Now Sedna was a major goddess and one of the big gods they had was Tongar, Tongarsuk, T-O-R-N-G-A-R-S-U-K, Torngarsuk. Now if you're forming a heavy metal band, the name Torngarsuk is available. Um, Torngarsuk is the polar bear god. He's the god of all polar bears, and because he controls the most powerful land animal, he controls all the animal on land. So he controls the caribou and everything else and that crows and goes across the land, much the same way Sedna controls the animals of the ocean. Um, he's depicted usually as a humanoid bear, like half human and half bear. And um, Torngar Sucker could sense when someone had the potential to become a shaman. So there was a ritual that you had to go through. Um, is different for males and females. If you're a male, Tongar Suck would approach you and take on the form of a giant, like a Godzilla-sized polar bear. Wow. And he would eat you. He would chew you up, swallow you, you would pass through his entire digestive tract, and then he would deposit you on the ground. And when you woke up from that, which you would, you would suddenly find that you could now see the spirit world. It was as clear to you as anything. And you had all these powers to communicate with spirits. You just had to live with the trauma of being eaten and digested by a gigantic polar bear. Um, what the women went through, women were approached by Torngarsak in his, in his more humanoid form, and he would spend the night with them. Hmm. And that was the ordeal that they had to go through. Some people say the women had it better, I'm not sure, a polar bear, yeah. Well, you said in human form. He, com he comes in a more humanoid form, but he's still a bear god. So, yeah. Do we have images depicting this humanoid polar bear guy? Yep, there's images on the internet of it. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, Torngarsuk. Um, yeah, so he's the one who chooses the shamans from the tribes, and they play, like I said, the major role in helping people survive. Um, so that is the Inuit. Very cool. I thought they were extremely cool people. Um, it's... I'm not familiar with with much of what we discussed, so this is very new, very intriguing. Um, I definitely want to see his picture. Yeah, <laughs> I can give you some feedback on yeah, <laughs> what might yeah, be worse. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So they have a really cool society, um, and next time we will move further south where it's warmer. Okay. And we'll keep on with another mythology next time. Very cool. Right. Until then, this has been conversations. I've been Ed. Solitaire. I'll see you next time. Until then, be safe. <laughs>